Okay, it looks like the folks coming in from the waiting room are, are in, so I will get started. My name is David Lazax. I'm a senior fellow at Croton Institute. And thank you for joining our Croton conversation today on intersectional impact across food, fiber, and finance. And today's session is part of a larger series bringing leaders working on the front lines of finance, social change, and ecological resilience into deep dialogue to address some of today's some of the world's toughest social and environmental challenges. The Croton Conversation Series is a project of the Croton Institute. We're an independent nonprofit whose mission is to harness the power of investment for social good and ecological resilience. Before we get started today, let me just share a few housekeeping items with you. Uh, first, the conversation is being recorded and it will be available on our website and our YouTube page after today's session. Uh, if you're joining us by Zoom, please use the question and answer box to ask questions at any time and we'll be saving some time at the end of today's uh, conversation to go through some of those questions. And if you're watching on YouTube right now, you can post your questions in the comment box. Uh, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can by the end of the session. And this is a long disclaimer that I will not read, but quickly, um, we may or may not be talking about some investments and it is a regulated industry. So we are here today to educate and not to solicit. If you hear about a product or opportunity, please do your own due diligence. Uh, and this is not investment advice. Um, so today's session is the start of what we hope will be a, uh, a mini series, a short kind of exploration of topics across food, fiber, and finance. And today's session is starting with uh, these distinguished speakers that we're going to hear a little bit more from uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but before we get into introductions and some of the content that we're hoping to cover today, just a few kind of opening uh, opening remarks and framing from me. Um, and so today we're going to explore a number of topics across agriculture and why agriculture with, you know, the very broad mission of, of the Croton Institute and all that we do is that in our economy, we grow or we mine everything that cycles through, through our economies. And we know that we need to shift from the use of non-renewable to renewable resources and from the linear use of products to more circular economies. And when we think about the land and also of the water, of course, as I look at Mark's background behind him in, in Hawaii, uh, it's, it's about all the products that come from our landscapes. It's, not, it's, it's artificial really to separate those that we eat from those that we wear. Uh, so you know, to, to separate food from fibers, textiles, and leathers is something that you know, we're really trying to think of this these systems more holistically and how we can manage it together, not only for uh, the environment, environmental outcomes, but also uh, for our communities and our social systems as well. Uh, as we've heard over, especially the last year, uh, is that the food and fiber systems that we have today aren't necessarily broken, but they're working as they're designed. They're working to be, uh, in many cases, extractive and degrading of our resources and um, really aggregating capital uh, in, in uh, unfair and potentially unjust ways. Uh, but why we're, why we're here today, why we're having this conversation today, why uh, these speakers and many of you who are, who are listening in today, uh, we're all working to, to redesign these systems. Uh, and we know that we need to do that with not just focus on optimizing on a single impact, not just looking at one part of these integrated systems, but we're here to really talk about how we work toward a more intersectional impact. And when we say that, you know, it, it's not a, a very common term, but one that I think that the ideas behind are really gaining traction in, in a lot of these conversations. Uh, so first and foremost, we know that, that agriculture is multifunctional. Uh, to date, we've had really an, an overwhelming focus on quantity instead of quality and on price over impact. 
And we really need to approach uh, the management of our, our land and the people in the communities that those interface with, with a more holistic set of lenses. And as we argued in our 2019 uh, soil wealth paper is that we not only have to look at the soil piece of that in the landscape, but also of community wealth and community health. And it's really the integration of those pieces, excuse me, um, as it relates to some of these uh, flows of finances that we'll be getting into a little more depth today. Uh, and on top of that, it's that the health and well being aspect of uh, these entire value networks and value webs and value chains uh, from farmers and eaters to manufacturers and wearers. Um, we, are, we're, we are coming into these conversations you know, with that lens that is really. Uh, that really uh, pairs nicely with some of the other impacts and other uh, other ways we're talking about some of these intersectional impact. And it's critical that, that those, those lenses be part of this focus as well. And one that is increasingly important to me and, and many of the, the folks uh, in this community is really about time. And not only from the perspective of needing to look forward and needing to, to, to design um, systems for the future, but also in a more retrospective uh, uh, way and how we, we look uh, backwards as well. And many of us talk about regenerative agriculture, and sometimes we like to say it's something new, but really it's not. Uh, and many of the, in many cases, the practices we were talking about have indigenous roots, they have roots that go back hundreds, if not thousands or tens of thousands of years. And it's really important that in this conversation and in conversations uh, you know, more broadly, that we respect and we honor uh, where, where some of these uh, uh, where production practices and ways of, of, of more sustainably managing our landscapes uh, come from. Um, and it's also time to uh, interrogate ownership and ownership structures, especially when there's opportunities to, um, uh, for, for community wealth generation and, 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 and uh, working toward ways in which uh, we don't have to have extractive use of resources, but really that regenerative use of resources. And finally, you know, connecting back to health, we know that the, the impacts of our choices around agriculture and, and land management have not only deleterious consequences today, but now in our understanding of epigenetics is showing us that it's future generations that are being impacted, uh, whether through trauma, whether that be nutritional trauma, whether that be through some of the toxic inputs that are used in our landscape today, is that, in, that ac actions and activities today not only have impacts today, but have impacts way into the future that we're just beginning to understand. And while all of what I talked about was really land focused, you know, today in the conversation and much of the work at Croton Institute is, is really centered on how the tools of finance as just one set of tools in this larger toolbox can help us reimagine our relationship to the land and food and fiber and other materials. And we know that it's this relationship between these systems and between capital that we're starting to, to, to reimagine. And I was recently reminded uh, by my colleague, Joshua Humphreys, uh, at the Croton Institute that it's our commonly used finance terms like bonds that were named so because they connected us and equity was about fairness. And we've clearly lost some of that meaning. And in this session and our work that is broader than that, um, it's you know, deeply part of that dialogue that we're trying to reclaim some of the, some of the meaning around what finance meant that is gonna be more in service of a more just and equitable society. And clearly this is a conversation that is happening, will happen today and will happen beyond today. And I'm really honored that I am joined here by some of my distinguished colleagues. Uh, who, if I know I was stranded on a desert island and was, and was tasked with, with fixing some of our most vexing problems, these are the folks that I'd want to be with solving those problems. Um, so we'll take just a minute for, for each of them to uh, kind of give a, a one breath introduction. You'll see streaming through some of their more extended bios in the chat. Uh, and then we'll go on to some more of the content in today's session. So a day, go ahead. I'm really honored to be here. 
I'm Ade Briones, I'm Coach T in Kiowa, and I run the Native Agriculture and Food Systems Program at First Nations Development Institute. Sarah. Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Kelly. I run Common Threads Consulting, working with a range of philanthropic clients on strategy and research, and I've had the privilege to serve as a consultant to sustainable agriculture and food systems funders and project director for the Fibers Roadmap Project. Mark. Hello, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this exciting and needed conversation. Uh, my name is Mark Watson. I'm serving as managing director of the Fair Food Network's Fair Food Fund, our investment initiative. Jenny. Hi, everyone. Um, I echo the thanks to Croton and David and everyone and my colleagues here for having me today. I run a consulting firm, Guidelight Strategies, and uh, work with a lot of funders, investors, and policymakers across the food and ag space um, and system solutions, strategies for financing. And um, yeah, happy to be here with you all. Thank you. And that we'll do that, that same network around for a couple minute reflection on our, on our opening question, which is, how is your work designing, enacting, implementing, and are supporting some of the intersectional impact within agriculture in, in, in and around the systems that you work? Great. And I'm just going to put a timer because we, we were told we have five minutes. So again, I work at First Nations Development Institute. I'm the Director of Programs for Native Agriculture and Food Systems. And essentially we're a granting intermediary. So we give out grants to primarily indigenous community-based food and agriculture projects. Um, we have we've have over 400 grantees um, that we've supported. And so I'm speaking to you from that perspective as a person who supported indigenous food and agricultural projects throughout the mainland, Hawaii and Alaska. And at First Nations, we absolutely believe that when armed with the appropriate resources, which includes capital, indigenous communities have and can exert their ingenuity to address our own issues. And let me say that one more time. We absolutely believe that when armed with the appropriate resources, indigenous communities have and will exert their own ingenuity to address their own issues. Why is this statement so important? And some of the points I wanted to make David so um, eloquently stated in the introduction, um, he talked about the separation of food from, from fiber, but also when I look at the projects that we support, we see mainstream agricultural definitions uh, severing the connections between food and people, land and people. And so the statement is so important because one, it's rare that indigenous people are given the resources like capital, like land, like agency, and then second, we're not often given the faith and agency to address our own issues. So in all sectors, including agriculture, so embedded in our existence and design at First Nations is the idea that we are working for indigenous people and community to implement our own solutions. That is critical. I know it's a simple statement, but its simplicity gets lost in the sea of history, especially in agriculture, and the processes and procedures that have excluded and silenced often violently indigenous people from exerting their own skills, um, especially in the field of agriculture. And we still see the remnants and the residues of that history today. So agriculture, when we think about it historically is modeled on this idea of displacement and subjugation. Um, and what do I mean by this? Agriculture was like the mode of civilization. It's the dividing line between who was civilized and who is not, who could be considered a farmer, who could be considered a landowner and who could not. And when we think about agriculture in its historical ter terms, it paints a very specific picture 
of who and how we practice agriculture. And we see, like David said, the, the system was made for, for what we have. It, we see this, this historical definition playing out in present day agricultural practices. And it's a model that rests on the very idea that food processes and procedures are, have, been, have been severed from the need um, and we see this play out over and over again in policy and social supports. So what I mean by that is like, we see the separation of food from fiber, food from community, food from land. And this severance does, does cause serious, um, serious profiles in agriculture that we eventually have to correct if we're not trying to correct them immediately now. And so in our native agriculture and food systems program, we only focus on community-based um, food and agriculture projects. And inherent in the system of agriculture is, um, American system of agriculture is this concept of hyper-individualism, but that's often antithetical to indigenous food systems. And we can think about it, like think of clam farms in the Pacific Northwest or bulb management in California or buffalo migrations and herd management in Dakotas, wild ricing in the Great Lakes. And these are all examples of indigenous forms of agriculture that are not often recognized in mainstream. And some of the most important and I have just a few more seconds, some of the most important contributions to how we think about systems, food production, do come from indigenous communities. But again, when we think about agriculture as being, um, being the central port, point of displacement and subjugation, some of those products that come from indigenous communities are then taken and commodified. And so we try to address that in all of the projects that we, we um, support at First Nations. And uh, hopefully we'll have time to like talk more about the specific projects. But thank you for that introduction, David, and I'll pass it on. Thank you so much, Ade. Sarah? Thanks, David. Thank you, Ade, for both of you for bringing forward uh, many important things that um, I'd love to touch on and, and pick up on. So I'll start with the top line intersection that our work on the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders Fibers Roadmap focuses on the intersection that fibers are part of our agricultural system. It's great to not have that be the first person to say that in this uh, call. They intersect in terms of uh, both cropping systems, intercropping or crop livestock systems, in terms of our agricultural infrastructure, like um, equipment dealers or transport, and in terms of livelihoods for rural communities, for indigenous communities, and that's domestically and globally. So uh, my roadmap team partners and I, that's Jenny and Cala Rose Ostrander and I on the team, um, really had had the opportunity to work with funders and investors in a range of contexts and see the incredible support they had put forward for sustainable agriculture and food reform and so we aimed with the Fibers Roadmap to bring forward a seven year vision or roadmap for the kinds of funding and financing that are needed to help revitalize US based uh, fiber production and processing of soil based natural fibers as part of our agricultural system in all the intersectional systems uh, that we're looking at today. Um, I, I just wanna maybe highlight a little bit um, a sort of set of intersections between the fiber and textile industry, equity and racial justice issues and financing, uh, picking up on, on much that's been mentioned. I think many people are familiar with um, the idea of labor justice in the fiber and textile industry, garment worker justice, and that's absolutely still part of the picture. But the more we went on in this project, the clearer it became that the fiber and textile industry, especially in this country, is, is completely intertwined with um, the uh, dynamic that Ade mentioned of stolen land from indigenous people, of displacement of indigenous people, as well as stolen labor from the system of slavery, enslaved black people. And these are both entwined with the development of the capitalist financial system uh, from the connection between cotton planters in the South, the mills in the North, which themselves relied on exploited labor from children and women, 
And they uh, not only pioneered this trading system, but also a lot of the financial instruments that were used to finance its development, including things like mortgages backed by enslaved people as collateral in mortgage-backed securities that hid those abuses from the people who purchased the eventual securities. So when you, when you look at that basis, it just becomes so clear that we can't work towards solutions with the same set of financial tools and expectations that created that system in the first place. And so in the roadmap, we really try to question the idea of, you know, just looking for projects in the fiber system that are investment ready or having a set of expectations around quote unquote market-based returns but instead calling for um, more just and equitable financing. And especially um, as, as a day mentioned, picking up on, uh, on, on returning ownership to communities that have um, been extracted from by the textile industry and ownership and decision-making power over the financing. Um, just a quick mention that we're really honored to be able to feature Native American fiber program run by Fred Briones as one of the case studies in the roadmap along with a range of projects around the country. You can pretty much just funnel that uh, financial, that legacy right into the current structure of the global textile industry where brands are basically chasing the cheapest labor pr prices all around the globe, trying to replicate that set of conditions. And that usually ends up being the labor of women of color. And there's a financing and payment term system that goes alongside of it where risk is essentially shunted onto those at the beginning of the uh, supply chain where farmers are expected to be price takers, where mill and tannery owners are expected to essentially front the cost of the products and brands only take ownership at the very end of the chain. So that structure led to some of the biggest financing barriers that we heard about where uh, small farmers, ranchers and fiber producers have a lot of difficulty accessing capital, working capital, collateralizing loans because they're not able to access contracts from brands until they've already reached a large scale of production sets up this kind of catch 22 or commitment catch 22 as we called it. So uh, one of the things that you had asked your question about what we're trying to enact and implement, we're really moving into the stage of enacting some of the levers in the roadmap. And one of those ideas is a fund, what we would learn from our training in the RSF integrated capital fellowship to call an integrated capital fund, some say catalytic capital, but really trying to uh, create a source of funds that would help unlock some of these barriers, uh, create success stories, an upward spiral, not a forever solution to the entire set of issues in the industry, but trying to help us move into um, just re envisioning what a more positive uh, reshored US industry could look like. And we've touched a little bit as well in our conversations and with you, David, with SAFSF on ideas around a divest invest strategy for the fiber and textile industry, helping investors understand what their money is doing right now invested in multinational conglomerates and how we could shift that capital uh, to a set of more just uh, regenerative approaches that returns that control uh, to communities that have been impacted. So really excited to hear from Mark and Jenny and to be part of today's conversation. Thanks so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Sarah. Mark, up next. Well, it's tough after a day uh, so well outlined the negative impacts of the behaviors that we globally have uh, put forth. And Sarah, you gave wonderful underpinnings in terms of the mechanics of how we got here. And I wanted just to talk a little bit about both Fair Food Network and also a lens through which we're viewing the world. And I'll admit it is a, it's a, a revised lens. Um, first, a little bit more about me. My first job, uh, which was 35 years ago, was a little intern working in a large money center treasury department. And my job was to calculate the cost of funds every morning. And you wonder, well, how is that related to this exciting topic that we're talking about today? And actually was the lens that I actually view the work that, that we do at Fair Food Network, which is I had to figure out all the great, all these different sources of capital to come up with a way to redeploy in a way that met this particular bank's needs so that it would be able to continue. And it lived on the trust of the community to be able to fulfill those commitments. 
So here I am at 35 years later, uh, helping to refine the deployment strategy of capital. And I use that word broadly for Fair Food Network, which has as elements of its capital, knowledge. We have uh, more than 28 states where we have knowledge of community via our food incentive program, which is part of the Double Up uh, program, which we launched in Michigan. So we have community partners that understand those communities and we know how to reach those communities. We have knowledge of policy in order to design and execute a food incentive program that allows us to leverage uh, USDA dollars in the SNAP program with private foundational gifts. It takes some know-how to realize how to push the levers of government in order to leverage that arrangement. And so we have done that. We also have figured out how to take integrated capital debt and grant and equity and provision in a way that it can be catalytic, not only at the entrepreneurial level, but the next iteration, which I'm suggesting we all should look forward to is at the community level and then the systems level. So I wanna talk a little bit about that at this point, because the lens that I'm trying to describe is, is when we talk about capital and food systems and fiber systems, it by definition has to be holistic. And we have fallen to this reductionist viewpoint where capital is driving the outcomes. When people are at the beginning of the system and at the end of the system, I happen to be in Hawaii and I'm not, I mean, this is the perfect place that actually evidences the destruction of a food insecure people. Climate change has been raining for two days, two weeks straight, and no real, I mean, 90% of the product is imported. That was not the case. So <clears throat> the lens that we're using at Fair Food Network is what happens if an entity, and it doesn't have to be a fair food, it can be any entity, holds the community's vision of autonomy and self-determination and what food comes into their community and how it's produced and how it's disposed of, the scraps. And what does that look like? And so our approach is to serve as this integrator almost of informed and disciplined by the community vision. And that can serve in the form of an advisory group that reviews the interaction of financial intermediaries, TA providers, and policymakers, and actually allows a feedback loop to occur. So one of the ways that that manifests itself is we are, uh, we've been appointed as the administrator for the Michigan Good Food Fund starting January of this year. And that has initially been a very successful mandate and a collaboration of intermediaries who are lending intermediaries. But we know that food systems need long-term patient capital. They need investment capital that has uh, below quote market rate returns. They need inclusiveness in terms of deal discovery. They need to fill out distribution channels and all parts of the food value chain. They need um, participation by disadvantaged communities like Detroit, which happens to be ground happened to be one of the ground zero sites in this country in terms of health disparities. And, and so we are trying to serve in that role to be a clearinghouse, so to speak, of the resources and then allow communities to have voice over what deals happen, at what price they happen, when they happen, and what parts of the distribution chain are invested in, and then raise that effort to policymakers uh, at the state and, and, and national level. So that's a big vision. We already have a head start after five years in Michigan, uh, where we've uh, done 35 deals together with other partners, uh, including Northern Initiatives and Michigan State University. But we also, there's a role for mission-based private equity. There's a role for collateral pools. There's a role for Native American communities to inform how those dollars and, and resources reach their community. There's a role for knowledge that's already invested in Detroit to come back to other entrepreneurs who need to learn how to serve them properly. So that's one of the ways that we're trying to evidence that. The second is another location, which is Camden, New Jersey, where we have been supported by a large corporate partner who's trying to 
find ways that all the dollars that swish around the new, uh, Northeast always seem to happen to miss a community that has 40% of its community members who have been somehow involved in the, uh, uh, have been incarcerated or family members have been. There's almost little to no wealth. And how do the, and they're food insecure with one grocery store that's on the outskirts of town. But this is next to Philly, New York, Boston. It's a, how does that exi exist? So one of the ways we're trying to again play this integrator role of braiding knowledge that can be TA, it can be access to policymakers, capital, all forms of capital market and below market grants, recoverable grants, and certainly, um, discovery process to allow community members to actually live in the community, maybe there's an opportunity to design and support a cooperatively owned grocery store or a hub of a food club that brings in healthy food that's supported by SNAP benefits. Somebody has to hold that vision. So we're not saying we have all the answers, but we're offering to play this glue of the many anchor partners that have created this system that are often just looking through their own prism. I call it agency conflict, which is how we've gotten where we are. And then have the community to have an opportunity through an advisory board or some way to inform the activities of the professionals, so to speak. So that's a, a big vision. That's the way, the way that we're moving through. We are a national organization. These are two clusters. We're also in New England. But our expectations over time that we would be national, but in place-based clusters with the same mix of capital, broadly defined. So I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to Jennifer. Amazing, thanks Mark and Sarah and Aday. So um, that's tough three acts to follow and I probably will just reiterate some of the um, same points that my colleagues are making when we're looking at capital structures in our agricultural system. And maybe I'll just highlight the lens of uh, the kinds of capital producers are able to access, which is really critical across when we look at the agricultural system. You know, much of what Ade and Sarah laid out for us are, are the structures that um, are provided to producers and communities and rural communities and producers and farmers of all kinds are extractive. The current capital structures that we have keep them in this perpetuating cycle of extraction and injustice. Also, the access to that capital is, is quite um, unequitable. And, and we saw this across our fiber roadmap work that Sarah described, and then also work that I did on um, barriers for farmers and ranchers across the US to adopt regenerative practices. What came up a lot was their access to capital and then the kinds of capital structures that they can access, keep them in our current industrial ag system and don't leave a lot of room for them to move outside that system. And all of the risk as well of those capital structures is on these farmers and producers. And so we have to start thinking about as both, you know, David mentioned earlier that our agricultural system is complex multifunctional system with a multitude of benefits that connects all life as a day really put it really well the connection from land all the way to people and what goes on in our landscapes really goes on in all of us. And so we are often seen in the space financing structures from investors to our farm credit system, public financing, private financing, that is based on a one dimensional uh, set of outcomes, which is profit and yield, where our agriculture systems are actually multidimensional with a multitude of benefits. So imagine if we're instead of, if, you know, basing our investments on profit and yield, what if we were basing our investments on community health and resilience, or out, you know, measurement and metrics on nutrient density per acre instead of profit per acre. So how do we start to change the way we're evaluating how we're investing in these landscapes. The current system has all these external costs that are not accounted for in how we're evaluating this financing. And that can be from climate change to impacts on soil health and human health, loss of biodiversity, land degradation, loss of community resilience and economic resilience. And so in our, you know, in my work and the work that I 
we'll continue, we're continuing to work on with Sarah on the fibers pro project, project and through a lot of other work with funders in the space and a project David and I are looking at is how do we start to create financing structures um, that have, that evaluate um, that, that lending and that funding through intersectional lenses, like Mark was talking about with Fair Food Network. So how do we evaluate our financing structures through ecological lenses across soil, animals, and land, community wealth and outcomes, that lens of building community economic self-determination and community resilience, which will be critical, especially in the face of changing climate and human health outcomes from farmer to farm workers to the way, all the way to the eaters and the wearers in the case of fiber. And so I think a lot of our work is focused around building that in those intersectional lenses into our evaluation and our um, management of financing into the space and looking at how we account for those in a true cost accounting lens of the kinds of financing that we're putting out into the space. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, David, and I think, and I both can speak to projects that we're looking at to move capital to producers that is equitable, but also looks at that capital through those lenses, as opposed to just looking at it through the lens of profit and yield per acre, which has continued to perpetuate this extractive system um, that we've built our agricultural system on. And, um, and especially, you know, I think we look at this not just, um, not just on the food side, but as Sarah mentioned, fiber side too, that these are interconnected systems that um, we're using our land for both of these things. And so how do we connect all these ideas? Thank you, everybody. And just uh, just a reminder to uh, all those out there watching and listening today to please put any questions you have in the question and answer box, and we're going to get to those soon. But I just want to open it up for kind of a dialogue between the panelists now. Uh, with reflections about what we have coming, you know, from what each of us shared and ways we see kind of uh, this work, this movement really growing in, in some of the areas that uh, we know that we need to address coming out of today, needing, we knew we need to address going into today, and, you know, also some of the exciting things that you're seeing uh, out in the landscape that uh, maybe we haven't been able to, to touch on yet. I just thought for uh, one quick reflection. Um, based on what Jennifer and Mark um, said that really resonated because they were more focused on the finance side. Like I feel, and Mark, you can disagree with me, but like First Nations exists, Fair Food, Food Network exists because when in financing, you're looking at taking on risk, like you're working in Camden, New Jersey. I'm working on Indian reservations throughout rural America and rural communities in Hawaii. Like we are considered high risk organizations. Like we support high risk projects and communities. But when I think about it in those terms, like, like David said in the beginning, if I was on a desert island, like I want to be with my grantees because they have the know-how to work within these environments. But when we put them into the finance sector, these communities are probably higher risk and probably less likely to, to come out well in the matrixes of finance. So it tells me that the way we think about risk is really a problematic and it's, um, it's racialized, very much racialized. If most of the communities, if almost all the communities that I work in are considered high risk, that's like all of Indian country. So it's like we really have to think about how we define risk in finance and really dig into why it's become so racialized. I, um, in response to a day, um, I want to introduce um, a controversial co concept, and it's a word um, that has double entendre and it's called uh, reparative capital. And reparative capital, the double entendre is reparations and repair. Uh, just, and it, it is capital that, that we as an investment community need to offer in recognition of past harms that have already, the debt is actually on the investor, it's not on the community. 
And so that means recoverable grants. That means straight grants. That means, you know, low interest loans in recognition of just like we recover soil to produce, you know, organically grown healthy, you know, foods. There are parts of the landscape of our society that have been disinvested in and over extracted from that need regeneration. And that does, you cannot regenerate with market rate pricing. And so I wanna just acknowledge that. And so these areas that we're talking about, whether it's a Native, uh, Native American community or indigenous Hawaiian folks or African-Americans in the South, uh, which is a whole nother topic around fiber. And we wanna talk about the integration of intersection of fiber and food. That's African Americans in South Carolina, you know, that's Mississippi. That's so, but the, in order for us to actually follow through on this objective of holistic, regenerative, um, and, and socially just ag, it has to include reparative capital. And I don't see any other way around that. And Mark, one, one example that I've seen out there from one of our partners in this space, and more on the on the uh, natural capital side is Iroquois Valley uh, Farmland PBC, they're calling themselves these days, I believe, um, uh, through the support of a USDA conservation innovation grant, uh, put together this soil restoration note, which is the, the proceeds of that note go towards helping farmers to implement practices that will be restoring and repairing that soil and it's not a market rate return. And so we're, I think that is one example. I think there are many others out there, uh, but I think there, what we need to see is even more examples of that, both on the natural capital side and the social capital side, we're able to see those kinds of principles put forward into, into action. This is, I mean, these are such great points and I think just really, really picking up and agreeing with a lot of what's been said. Um, I think the points that Ade raised about risk are something that became really clear in our, our research and work into the fibers industry and, and just exactly echoing what you said, how much risk is racialized, risk is used to you know, connote projects that um, are, you know, are somehow seen as less desirable for a whole range of reasons that don't actually factor into account the real risks that we're facing in financing right now, which have to do with the climate change and uh, a whole range of sort of uh, the, the ways that the exploitative practices of the current system are coming home to roost, but those aren't priced. And so those don't get considered normally in what we consider risk. But um, I've had the chance to, through some other work with Croatian Institute to talk with some invest investment advisors recently. And something really interesting I've heard from them is that this idea of risk is what is sort of the top line thing that convinces their clients to think about change. I mean, for better or for worse, because I completely agree with, with what Mark said, that some capital needs to very intentionally and knowingly take responsibility and be reparative. But for the broad landscape of investors, this idea of, of really focusing people on the risk that they're holding in their portfolio seems to be a, a lever, I guess, to help create change. And, and maybe these are two ways that we can uh, kind of work hand in hand with sort of within our, our shared goal to, to shift capital. I think. Um, I'll just throw in because um, it's kind of topical that having a global pandemic is one really great way not to, to be flip about the suffering in any way, but it sure shows you which systems are resilient and which systems are not resilient. And in the fiber component of this, um, the first thing to go was the globalized system of sourcing products from all over the world. And the idea that we can just, you know, on demand have any kind of home good or wearable good or any fiber product, like say a face mask that we want or need at any point in time. And that very quickly was shown to be false and also shown to be something that was uh, covering up as, we, as I mentioned earlier, and we've talked about a whole range of abuses. So I think just um, the current situation that we're in has really helped us see uh, which systems are resilient and which are not. And maybe that's something that we can be building on as we think about building, like as Jenny said, true cost accounting, true cost pricing systems that really do a better job valuing uh, that long-term resilience. Yeah, I just wanna echo on the risk uh, 
piece of it, which I think is critical, not only for public, you know, we see that coming into play in public financing in a big way, how do, you know, much of our crop insurance and subsidies and policies that provide public capital to producers are based on totally outdated and inaccurate risk profiles um, that are also rooted as a day set in injustice. Um, so we're not calculating risk uh, with all these externalities uh, factored in these important uh, climate change, community health. I mean, we, you know, last year, um, the CDC came out with a report that uh, farmers are the most likely to die by suicide. You know, we have all these, we have rural health issues, we have rural community issues. Um, we are seeing glyphosate and other chemicals show up in all of our food supplies. We're having huge increase in health, other health um, at things like asthma, risk to farm workers from pesticides. Um, you know, all these external costs are not calculated into these risk prof um, profiles and how we determine both public financing, but also private financing. Um, so I think the risk, uh, the understanding of these, you know, how we're calculating this risk is really critical in that true cost accounting lens. And I'd also just say like on the financing, you know, we're all talking about and all working on financing, how we provide the right kinds of capital to communities, to producers, and make sure that that capital is rooted in these intersectional lenses of community health and resilience, um, you know, ecological health and resilience, human health and resilience. But I, I think we've all seen, and certainly, you know, David and I are working on some projects right now where we've seen that even talking to, insta you know, your traditional investors in this space, the real, the biggest challenge is a mindset shift of understanding these concepts and like how integrated systems thinking really of how integrated these things are that, you know, we're, we're putting all this extractive capital into our landscapes and our landscapes are degrading. And they're having all kinds of costs and associated costs and risks and, you know, health, the decline of health across our lands and us. And we're not thinking about all those things when we invest. And so even when we see investors coming into the food and ag space right now, we're seeing a lot of those investments still tied to very one dimensional profit driven paradigms of capital. Like how do we, you know, build like lab produced food that'll fix the system, but it's not really addressing the root causes and issues that are going on in our system. So we have to, it's a mindset shift because these are natural systems that we all rely on, our land relies on that are not going to provide 10X profits, you know, returns, which is what a lot of investors, institutional investors especially are focused on. And so it's a mindset shift that's really a huge piece of the work that, that we have ahead of us. I, I caught a, a moment of some synchronized nodding there when when Jenny said uh, my, mindset shifts. So I wonder if, if, you know, what what do you think are, you know, I, I think it, it's easy to kind of go down and very quickly focus on what some of these examples are, but how can we open up this, you know, this dialogue around how do we shift mindsets so that, that it's easier to have these conversations and to get this, this hard work done that we know that needs to get done. I, I have a, um, another idea, um, just keep this going. So we've talked a lot about supply, supply of capital, supply of labor. We don't often talk about demand. Like a food system has demand and supply. So one of the things that I'm, and I don't have all the answers, but one of the areas that we're experimenting with is how do you get, I mean, there's a lot of money that moves through school districts. There's a lot of money that the large global CPG companies who, who say that they want ecologically sustainable supply chains, but are supporting the opposite. They say that they want, you know, fair labor practices, but supporting the opposite. So herein, I think law is an opportunity for capital to support entrepreneurs across the food value system and fiber system that are willing to take on the risk. If the demand side is willing to provide predictable revenue streams that investors can then fund the supply to meet the demand. So let me say that a, a more clear way. 
So what would it look like if you had school systems or CPG companies that collectively decided that they wanted sustainably grown uh, fibers in a consortium and provided forward contracts to a group of smaller but burgeoning and right mission aligned suppliers that we as investors could then provide cap. It would de-risk the entire system and actually build the supply chain that we wanna see. And so I'm just suggesting part of the mindset change, David, is, is let's not just look at the supply side. Let's, let's work on the demand uh, that feeds it so that the capital can be invited in in a way that, that we're not shoving all the risk downstream to the producer which is the way the world works today. I can maybe just give a couple quick thoughts on, on Mark's suggestion around that from, from the fiber side, um, two things. One is that a key piece of our work in the fibers roadmap is to try to bring forward the idea of reshoring components of our fiber and textile system, not as a total solution for all of our needs every day, including things that go well beyond apparel, but that's around us. But really, as, as Jenny said, as a kind of uh, mindset shifter in terms of transparency and really reconnecting us with these products. So I think that we have been trained, encouraged to not ask about anything but price for such a long time that most people are very, very disconnected from these products. So I, we see reshoring as a piece of transparency, reconnection, and that that in turn is a mindset shift, is a sort of paradigm shift for people to really start asking a different set of questions about what they're looking for. And I think uh, your question, Mark, about what would it look like if we had sort of a, like a consortium of, of buyers and, and building demand, I think that is maybe one piece where fiber and food do look different, but um, because that is often a barrier in the fiber system with, with brands being unwilling to issue such contracts, one a financial mechanism that we mention and try to um, explore in the roadmap and heard about from our interviewees is the idea of using guarantees as a tool, so having either brands or a combination of brands and funders utilize a guarantee structure so that the fiber businesses can access or collateralize loans without necessarily having to have those contracts in place up front. I mean, I would love to see us move more in that direction and I think there is a lot of scope for it, but we are confronted with a sort of entrenched reality right now where that can be challenging. So just offering that as one other financial mechanism that we might collectively be able to explore. And I, my two cents on the subject is that market-based solutions solely are not going to correct anything. I think there's such an entrenched coupling of social, federal, state policy that influences how we own land, how we produce food, who gets to do it, who is the consumer, who gets to be a producer. It's so intrinsically complicated that having only market-based solutions is probably not going to work because the market, as David said, is set up for the results we have. It's set up to support certain populations. It's set up so that we, we think there's this invisible hand. You know, that's one of the concepts I just couldn't get my mind around when I was in college, the invisible hand, like as if it, it moves in itself, but when and for indigenous communities, when we're looking at natural systems, there is a system, there is a function. The market is not the same way because capital is driven by people. Capital is attached to incentives. Capital is attached with goals. Like there is a human element that moves this invisible hand in the market. And so, and we like, we can't, to me, there's like faith in just the market is, is only part of the answer. So we really have to shift our mind to find the places where there has been so much social policy influence that that is actually like the codification of institutional racism that affects how we think the market functions. The market is not objective. The market is not moving on its own. Like there are human intentions behind this that are codified in every step of that process. Absolutely, thanks, Eric. We got just a few more minutes, and I've been trying to kind of integrate questions in here as the as the dialogue has gone forward. Maybe one more that I'm 
kind of aggregating a couple of questions here, but uh, you know, building on at least some of the work that Croton Institute did uh, and released recently, that there's at least as we calculated about a trillion dollars flowing through the U.S. Uh, agriculture and at least food system. We didn't touch the fiber system in that report. Um, and some of these pools, uh, such as Farm Credit and others, uh, you know, are supporting large, large, you know, large amounts of uh, you know some of the capital flows into U.S. Uh, agriculture, along with private equity and venture capital, real estate funds. How do you see these conversations beginning to, uh, you know, we're talking about changing the way that capital flows, and we're talking about the way that capital currently flows. Where where do these different uh, ways of thinking about capital flows really come together, uh, or and how can we begin to, uh, you know, really think about these from a systems change perspective in uh, kind of getting the the right kind of capital to the to uh, you know, producers and other value chain partners that are needing it to to really uh, you know produce goods, manage the landscape, and you know provide this, this these notions of community wealth. Or something else. I'm not sure if I'm really <laughs> answering your question, David, but since we just have a couple minutes left and I see a lot of questions are at people asking for like real specifics. I just want to briefly mention that I'm going to put the link to the SAFSF fibers roadmap in the chat. And we have 12 detailed case studies of U.S. fiber and textile businesses across the country that include a financial um, integrated capital pathway for exactly the kinds of funds they're seeking. And we also detail in the report in much more detail the levers, specific levers that we propose and the specific kinds of uh, fund, specific fund and financing vehicles. So I hope that can maybe answer um, with minimal time required. David, I'll offer a couple of specifics that answer both questions. So specifics, the collateral pool that Sarah talked about, we launched embedded in it is one-on-one -on -one TA. It's collateral pool for other investors to lend to deals that Fair Food actually want to support that are regenerative and equitable. And 50% of our deployments are to entrepreneurs of color across the board. So collateral pools that do the discovery process and quote de-risk, which is a bad term, but I'm gonna say it, to make the rest of the system actually behave more equitably. That's one. The second is I just talked to, is filling in gaps in the system. I talked to a, a black woman owned entity that has an app that is sourcing from BIPOC farmers up and down the Mississippi River and doing direct to institution from farm to community, Chicago Community Housing Project, which is a fantastic idea and doing medically tailored meals. So, and they need warehousing and hubs, et cetera, and the farmers are too small. So how do you help fund cooperatives? to allow the, the system to restructure, to allow smallholder farms to actually participate in the ecosystem. The third is legislation changes. We supported the state of New York in considering in its nutritional funding, um, at least informed others to, to do that work, to require that smallholder farms participate in some of these national federal flows of money. Uh, 75% of the farms in New York State are smallholder farms. None of them are able to even bid on these contracts because the prices are too low. And certainly BIPOC farms are prevented. So we are advocating to support others who want to do that work. So those are three ideas. Thank you so much, so, so much, Mark. And unfortunately, we're at the top of the hour. I'm sure we could probably go for for two more hours or days or weeks or months. But clearly, there's a lot of activity in this space, a lot of interest, and a, a lot of great work to be done. And just a, a thank you for everybody today that has joined us, uh, and especially to our, our speakers, Aday, Sarah, Jenny, and Mark, uh, and our donors who are helping to support this conversation. 
And finally, that uh, if you enjoy this conversation, there are many ways to support them going forward. We have a, a full slate of, of events uh, uh, set up for the next couple of months. Uh, you can consider asking your firm or to individually sponsor a future conversation. You can make a donation at crotoninstitute.org slash donate or when you're registering for a future conversation. And of course, we'll always uh, be happy to take your feedback using the survey that pops up at the end of the conversation or by emailing conversations at crotoninstitute.org. And lastly, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, please find the Institute and its work and our colleagues uh, and speakers today on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So with that, we can uh, close down today's uh, conversation. And again, thank you for joining us and see you all there out there soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.